candlelight adds a touch of magic to any scene, and even two simple candles like these in attractive holders can put the finishing touch to the setting for a dinner party. In this film, we're going to show how you can enjoy the craft of making many different kinds of useful and attractive candles like these. Basically, the techniques and materials used in the craft of candle making have remained the same since the time when candles were the main source of domestic lighting. Then, as now, the starting point was some good wax. Nowadays, paraffin wax is most commonly used for making candles because of its good burning qualities and cheapness. It normally comes in the form of small chips, ready packed in bags of standard size and weight. As you can see, it's very clean and easy to handle. The heart of any good candle is the wick. Wicks come in many different sizes. The size of the wick refers to the diameter of the finished candle the particular wick is intended for. The wick itself is made up of braided strands of cotton, treated with chemicals to make it burn better in the candle. Here are two candles of the same size, each with different size wicks. You can see how the candle on the left with the larger wick burns faster and with a bigger flame. This means you can choose the size of wick to suit the way you want your finished candle to burn. To show us some of the techniques more clearly, David Constable is going to start by using a heat-proof glass container to melt some paraffin wax. An ordinary domestic cooker, electric or gas, is quite adequate for melting all the waxes and dyes you'll need. Paraffin wax becomes completely liquid at around 60 degrees centigrade, about the same temperature as hot milk, and when liquid looks and behaves just like water. When a length of wick is dipped into melted wax, it soaks up a small amount of the liquid, which then hardens when the wick is removed. This is called priming the wick. If this dipping is repeated after the first coat of wax has hardened, another layer of wax will stick to the coated wick. In this way, you can continue dipping using a number of different lengths of wick, some cooling and hardening while you're dipping the others, and slowly you'll see slender, elegantly shaped candles forming before your eyes. This dipping technique is one of the oldest and simplest methods of making candles. To do it, all you need is just some wax, some lengths of wick, and of course a source of heat. You can see how, as the wax solidifies, the dipping process gives the candles their distinctive, simple shape. It's important to give the candles about a minute to cool between each dipping. Then after a short time, you'll find you've made a pair of perfectly matched candles. When the ends are trimmed and finished, and the wax left to harden properly, they're ready to use. Very simple and very elegant. While dipped candles are still soft, they can be twisted or hand molded to a variety of shapes. Here, David is plaiting three together. This way, you'll finish up with a candle with three wicks, which will burn down with three flames. It looks good, too. Or you can roll one out flat on a board with an ordinary rolling pin. You have to be a little careful it doesn't stick as you roll by turning it over a few times. If you want a simple flat candle, you can stop here. But it's even more interesting to twist the candle between your fingers as David is doing. This makes the candle into a beautiful twisted spiral. As long as the wax stays warm, you'll find it easy to shape. This twisted candle has been finished off by over dipping in wax colored with yellow dye. You can see just how soft and flexible the candles are while still warm. 
just right for hand modelling. David's pulling the wick out of the middle of this one. He'll put it back later when he's got the finished shape he wants. By twisting and squeezing, you can mould the soft wax into any shape you wish. Can you guess what this shape will be? It's useful to keep the liquid wax hot so that you can re-dip your wax model into it occasionally. This warms it up and adds more layers of wax. At this temperature, the wax isn't too hot to handle. In fact, it's quite pleasant to the touch, rather like warm plasticine, and it's completely odourless and clean. Yes, that's coming along nicely. When you're happy with the finished shape, you have to put back the wick. To do this, you use a long, thick needle called a wicking needle. Just thread the primed wick through the needle. And then push the needle and wick through the centre of the soft candle. To finish off, you tie a knot in one end of the wick to stop it coming out. Pull it through and trim the other end to the right length. This is some different wax, melted down to a liquid and dyed red. David's over-dipping just the top of the candle to make it really look like a toadstool. For the finishing touch, you can add small dots of liquid undyed wax, dripped on carefully with the wicking needle. The undyed wax drops cool to an opaque white, which stands out well against the bright red surface. And you can make them any shape or size you like. Once you've got used to handling and modelling warm wax, you'll probably want to try out a variety of shapes and sizes. Nothing could be easier than a pinched candle. You start with a small lump of warm wax, which you repeatedly dip in hot liquid wax to keep warm and plastic. Then you simply pinch out the edges into any shape you like. David has pinched out three edges here to form a sort of twisted petal shape. You can carry on like this, dipping and pinching, for as long as you like, bearing in mind that it has to be sturdy enough to eventually stand up and burn. When they're lit, these candles burn down in a really delightful way, leaving the edges of the petals standing up around the flame. To make certain candles, you will need some special equipment, but you'll probably find you have most of these items already in your own kitchen. For the next candle, David will be using a double boiler, some ordinary kitchen scales, a cooking thermometer and a small saucepan. The scales are very useful for measuring out quantities of wax. It's best to do this by weight. This time we're going to use some wax dye to produce a coloured candle. Dyes of all colours are available in the form of small solid discs. These discs are cut up and a small quantity, normally about 1% by weight, added to the main wax. In the top half of the double boiler, David is also adding some stearin. 
Stearin is a wax additive that improves the hardness and shrinking qualities of the wax as it cools. Once the dye and stearin have been thoroughly melted down together, you can add the paraffin wax chips. The bottom half of the double boiler is filled with water in the usual way. It's much easier to use a double boiler rather than a simple saucepan to heat the wax mixture, as this helps to keep the liquid at a constant temperature while you're making your candles. There's also no danger of the wax getting too hot and possibly even burning. This time, David's going to cast a one-colour candle using a plastic mould. Moulds are available in many types of material and shapes, but for a simple cylinder like this one, transparent plastic is best. After he's cleaned the mould thoroughly, he threads a piece of primed wick through the centre. He uses a wicking needle at one end to hold the wick straight and central. The other end he plugs with some mould seal, a sort of waterproof putty. This holds the wick tight and stops any hot wax leaking out of the bottom. There we are, all ready for filling up. After about 20 minutes, the dyed wax and stearin mixture should be ready to pour. When the mould is filled, it's a good idea to give the side of the mould some short, sharp taps to lose any air bubbles trapped on the sides. This will ensure a good, smooth surface on the candle. Then the filled mould is carefully placed in cold water to cool. The weight on the top stops it tipping over. As the wax cools, it shrinks, leaving a shallow well in the top around the wick. First of all, David pricks this well with a wicking needle to make sure there's no air trapped in the solid wax. Yes, that seems to be all right. Now we can top up the well with some more hot wax. When the candle has cooled and set hard, it comes out of the mould with no trouble at all. Once you've cast your basic candle, you can decorate the surface in a number of different ways. The bright green colour that David's using here is some strongly dyed hot wax. These pressed flowers and grasses are stuck to the surface of the candle with the end of a teaspoon heated up on an electric iron. You can create some quite interesting effects just by the way you cast the candle itself. David's half filling this cone-shaped mould with yellow dyed wax. First, he leaves it to set in a tilted position.
Then, when it's cooled a little, but still soft, he adds some more wax, this time in an upright position, and a different colour too. This way you end up with a layered candle of different colours, but make sure the wick is straight before it sets hard. These are thin sheets of wax made up from scraps left over from other candles. These are quite useful for the next sort of cast candle. David needs some small chunks of wax, all different shapes and sizes. He also prepares to melt down some paraffin wax chips. We shall need the wax a little hotter this time, so he's only using the top half of the double boiler. And we'll need some dye, heated up in an egg poacher. Next, the broken up chunks of wax are piled up in the mould. This mould's a star shape in plastic. It's particularly suitable for the sort of surface effect and colour of candle that this technique produces. Then you pour the hot wax over the chunks in the mould. The chunks melt a little, but not completely, and before the wax sets, you can drop in small quantities of strong warm dye to create a delightful swirly pattern. The finished candles burn down nicely too. Now here's a really easy way to get a spectacular surface effect. All you need is a large glass mould and plenty of crushed ice. Fill the mould with the ice, carefully packing it around a plain dipped candle that you support in the centre. This is the part of the candle that holds the wick and makes it burn properly. Right, here comes the easy part. You just pour in some hot wax dyed to the colour of your choice and let the natural action of the ice and hot wax do the rest. It's best not to spill too much wax while you're pouring, but if you do, don't worry, it easily cleans off when it's hard. Within a quarter of an hour, the candle has set, and when the remaining ice has melted, you're left with a delicate tracery of pastel-coloured wax. These are bullseye candles. They've been cast in square, rigid moulds. But how do you think David got the circular patterns on the side? Well, he started with a large dipped candle with the wick pulled out. He'd over-dipped a single white taper with different colours, so that each dipping gave a different coloured layer. Then he cut slices from the candle with a kitchen knife. This way you get lots of little multicoloured bullseyes. Simply stick two of these bullseyes with wax glue onto the side of the mould, then pour in the wax. The bullseyes melt just enough to blend in with the main colour of the candle. Of course, not all moulds are rigid plastic or glass. For irregular shapes and surface textures, for instance these fruit shapes, flexible rubber is best. Every piece of fruit in this picture is in fact a candle.
Better still for good surface effects are plastic moulds. You can buy these with many different patterns and designs. With the help of a little washing up liquid, it's always very easy to get the finished candle out of its mould. Then if you want to, you can overdip the pattern surface in another colour and afterwards reveal sections of the pattern underneath by melting away part of the surface with a hot electric iron. One of the fascinating things about candle making is that you can always invent your own moulds and ways of casting. Here, David is going to cast a candle inside out. He starts by filling a rubber balloon with cold water and then dips it in some hot wax. The wax cools quickly on the cold balloon and after dipping about ten times, a hard wax coating forms on the surface. Then you let the water out of the balloon. If you do this carefully, you're left with a thin wax shell. Next, you add spoonfuls of melted dye. A quick flick of the wrist gives you some exciting patterns. Eventually, the coloured shells will be filled with undyed wax, with a wick set in the middle. One more spoonful and that should do it. Another way of improvising a mould for a candle is to form a shape in some damp sand. The sand is usually strong enough to hold the hot wax that's poured into it and also combines with it to produce a rough sandy texture. The shape that David is using here is a square formed by packing damp sand around a piece of wood. When you've enough sand and are sure it's packed firmly around the wood, you can slowly pull the block out. This will be your candle mould, but make sure there's not too much sand at the bottom. Then pour in the hot wax, a little hotter than usual, about 127 degrees centigrade. The hotter the wax is, the more it will penetrate into the sand to give a thick sandy coating on the finished candle. Remember that when you're using wax at this temperature, you have to be a little careful how you handle it. As the wax cools, the level of the liquid drops. This is because the sand around it is soaking up the wax. So the mould has to be topped up with more hot wax about five minutes later. Then you leave it to cool for about two hours. When the wax is set, but still soft, this is the time to put in the wick. First, make a hole in the centre with a wicking needle and then just push the primed wick down into the hole. You can use the needle to hold the end straight and then top up again with more hot wax but be careful not to knock any sand from the sides into the liquid. After about five hours, the wax is cold and completely set. 
Now the candle can be tipped out of its bucket. You can see that although the inner candle has a square shape, the thick coating of sand and wax on the outside gives it a heavier, chunkier shape. Once you've got your basic candle shape, there are several methods of decorating the sandy surface. Firstly, you can shape the candle to any form you wish by planing off excess sand with a surform file. Then you can scratch a pattern or design into the surface of the sand. David's using a pair of dividers here to trace a circle. Then he carves deeper into the sand using an ordinary artist's scalpel. A small sharp knife would do the job just as well. If you want to reveal the original clear wax surface, you can melt away as much sand as you like using a gas blow lamp and a sharp knife. Finally, you can shape the wax in any way you wish with a hot electric iron. You can carry on like this, ironing back and melting away until you've got the shape and design you're happy with. Sand candles always burn down in such an interesting way, especially if you've made wax windows in the sandy surface. This is the simplest candle of all to make. Fantastic shapes are formed by pushing hot wax down into cold water. You start with a straight candle fixed to a base. Pour in the hot wax and then plunge it into the water. Simple, isn't it? There's almost no end to the style, shape and colours of candles you can make. All you need are the materials and your own imagination.